All right, so we all, um, we all know tomorrow we're celebrating Independence Day, of course. It's a big celebration, and uh, I wanted to preach a sermon that kind of goes in the, the spirit of our independence um, this morning. And, of course, the, the Independence Day, for those of you who don't know, it's not, uh, it's not the day the Constitution was put into effect or anything like that. It's when the, Uni when the United States or the colonies declared their independence from Great Britain. And um, I want to just point out that one famous sentence from the Declaration of Independence that we're celebrating tomorrow. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, of course, that's very, very famous. It's, 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 and for good reason. It's a great sentence. Now, it's not scripture. It's not Bible. And I'm not, just so you know right up front, you know, I'm not one of these people that, that thinks that the Constitution of the United States is divinely inspired and that it's like, you know, elevating the status of, of even the men that, that were involved in the foundation of the country to some, you know, too high of a, of, of a status that, that, you know, some churches kind of go a little bit overboard, even with the patriotism and stuff, and I think that in itself becomes an idol. But, I mean, I don't have a problem with it necessarily, but um, what I want to be preaching on is this is a good truth that is found in the Declaration of Independence. I'm going to show you from the, from the Bible, from Scripture, that... Um, some some truths about this saying that you know and this is this is i believe one of the reasons why this country started off and has been so great has been one of the greatest nations in the world is because of the foundation and the recognition of our creator now of course this is real generic and you you know a lot of people argue and fight over well thomas jefferson he didn't believe in that and he had his own bible and stuff yeah i know that you know, and there's, but there's other people, though, that have been around, and there's actually a lot of people that don't get very much credit at all, a lot of pastors and a lot of preachers that believed and reverenced and respected God's Word and had influence on the politicians of their day on how the, the country ought to be framed and how the laws ought to be made and all this other stuff. But when you look at the, the founding documents and the laws that were put in place, they, they very well, they pretty closely followed many, many of the laws of the Bible and many of the principles of the Bible. And that's because there was a great respect for God and the Bible at that time. And I think that is a, a, one of the reasons why God has blessed this country so much and we become so fruitful. And when we see this statement like this, just in the, in the Declaration of, Indep of Independence, the statement that these truths are self-evident. Like, like it, it, and what it's saying is that the rights that we have, we have certain rights that are given to us by God. No government gives you this right. No other man gives you these rights. And I think that's a concept that's slipping these days is that people look to the bigger and bigger the government gets, people are looking to the government to give them permission to do things for many things that God has already given you permission for. And we don't need to be looking to some institution. We don't need to be looking to some other man to say, yes, it's okay for you to do this. And um, we need to be very careful about this and be able to assert our own freedoms and the, and the rights and the liberties that God has given us naturally just by being his creation. Now, in, um, in the message here, we see, or in the passage, the, the Acts chapter 22 we see similar situations like this coming up, especially in the life of Paul and what he was doing, where he's being arrested, they're beating him, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going in, they're laying hands on him, and they're detaining him and arresting him when he hasn't even done anything wrong. You know, it's just because a whole bunch of people got mad at him, and that's what happens in this story is that, you know, people were getting angry at his preaching, angry at his beliefs, and there was this big uproar. And people are all upset, so then, you know, of course, the cops come in, you know, the, the soldiers come in, and they, they take them, and they're like, well, we're going to figure out what's going on. This, guy's, this guy must just be a troublemaker. And they set him up, they bring him into the castle, for one, just because, you know, get him away from the, the angry mob that's outside. And it says in verse 24 that, that they were going to examine him by scourging. So examining means they're going to be asking, they're going to get down to what's really going on. And what the, 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 first, the first method that they're going to use is, well, we're just going to beat it out of him. We're going to beat him and beat him until 
he finally tells us what's going on. You know, this guy must be a criminal for all these people to be upset with him. And um, it says in verse 25, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? He's saying, hey, wait a minute, before you go on and start beating me, is it legal? Is it legal for you to be doing this? Can you just tie me up and start beating me, being a Roman and uncondemned? He's like, I haven't even been found guilty of anything yet, and you're going to be beating me? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Now, and then of course they don't, they don't beat him after that. Being a Roman citizen at that time came with extra rights, extra freedom, extra liberty. And that's why the, the chief captain said, hey, it cost me a lot of money to obtain that freedom. He said, I, I, you know, I worked hard at this and I, and I had to pay the government you know, a lot of money to join myself to be actually called a citizen of Rome, to be a Roman citizen and to enjoy the freedoms. And Paul says, yeah, but I was free born. Now, we all are free born when it comes to the rights and the freedoms and the liberties that God has given to us in that sense. We have the right to believe what we want to believe. God has given us a free will, a will to decide what it is that we want to do in our life and what we're going to believe. He didn't make us robots and he didn't say that you have to, you know, we're just forced to do certain things. God doesn't force you to do anything. He's given us his law and he says these are sins and, you know, and this is what I want you to do. But he doesn't force anybody to do those things. And we have the will to decide whether or not we're going to choose to do those things. And the problem is that we have a government that wants to step in and try to take the place of God and the authority that God has over our lives. Because God has established, and we're not going to go there, but in Romans 13, it talks about the, the powers that be are ordained of God. And God has ordained specific powers and authorities in our life. There is an authority within the family. There's an authority that a father and a husband has within his own family and that he has certain things that, that he is allowed and ordained by God to have control over. Um, God has ordained a power of the government to be able to punish the evildoers, to have this ability and this authority to execute a judgment upon a criminal. Because, and, and it makes sense if you think about it. Um, None of us have the authority individually to just inflict harm on somebody else. We don't have, we're not given that authority. And, and harm, I don't mean like giving your kids a spanking. I mean like, like, like injuring somebody or doing something you know, a little bit more drastic, like maybe taking another person's life. Which is why the institution of a government was created to be able to punish evildoers. So that way, if someone does go out and commit a crime like murder, now we have a way of dealing with it to where there is an authority given to be able to take another person's life. Because individually, we don't have that right. That's not one of God's rights given to us, that you just have the right to take other people's life if you think they've done you wrong. But in the, in the construct of a, of a civil government, we do have that right, and that, right is, that, that power, that authority has been delegated to the government. And then, of course, we have you know, church authority and God's authority. Ultimately, God's authority supersedes everybody's authority. That, that is the overarching um, laws and, and everything that we need to be following is the law of God. Now, in this passage with Paul, we see that, you know, the Roman government, we, first of all, we know that the Roman government was not some great example of a godly kingdom. Right. I mean, there were some good principles and some, you know, some things that, that, that they had incorporated. But overall, I mean, it's not like the Roman Empire was some godly kingdom. It was not. And it definitely was not right that they had different classes of people. You know, oh, well, you're a Roman. You know, because they were just they were, these people were just willing. You know, one of the Roman citizens himself was willing to just go ahead and just beat Paul. Just beat him. Just say, well, he's done, he must have done something wrong, so let's just beat him until it comes out of him. That's not right. And they, were in, they didn't even change their mind until all of a sudden, oh, oh, you're a Roman citizen. Why should that even matter? You know, he's a human being just like anyone else. You know, you shouldn't just say, well, if, unless you're a Roman citizen, we're, we just have the right to just beat you. And just beat you, to whip you, and do whatever we want with you, and treat you however we want. 
You know, that's not right either. And the chief captain be having to spend a lot of money for that privilege of being a Roman citizen. I don't think that's right either. You know, why should you have to buy your way into just having some decent respect for other people or, or being able to enjoy rights or liberties or freedoms? None of those things, I think, are righteous. And as Paul was about to get beat in order to, to get him to talk, he still nonetheless used those rights that he had as a Roman citizen. Now, I don't think it's wrong for us to claim, you know, what, what, whatever your, your um, feelings are or, or thoughts on the, the government we have today in the United States of America. You know, just like Rome wasn't great, Paul still used those rights that he had and he enjoyed. Say, hey, look, I'm free born. I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this to me. In another example, we see him appealing unto Caesar, right, when they were, when they were trying him wrongfully. He went through the channels and he's like, hey, I'm going to go through this way and I'm not going to... Um, I'm not just going to let this stuff happen to me. You know, there's, there's a concept of suffering wrong in the Bible. When someone does you wrong, just, you know, turning the other cheek and allowing yourself to be defrauded. But then there's also the case here where we have, like, the Apostle Paul, he's about to get beat. He didn't just let them beat him. Look, if there's a way out of getting his beating, he's like, I'm going to take it. You know, do you, is it legal for you to do this to me? Being uncondemned? I mean, he didn't do anything wrong. And when you look at those two different examples, it's not a contradiction in the Bible. When you look at allowing yourself to be defrauded, that's talking about within the church when someone else, one of your brothers in Christ, does you wrong within the church. He's saying, instead of taking them to court and going before the unbelievers to have them judged, why don't you just suffer yourself, allow yourself to be defrauded? Is, is the context of what that teaching is, which is completely different from this, where Paul's just preaching He's preaching the truth. He's preaching the gospel. People hate it. And they're, you know, getting angry at him. And then the, the, the cops come, the government officials come, and they just want to beat him up. I mean, that's not right. Now, if it happens, it happens. And, you know, if it happens for the cause of Christ, he'll still be blessed for it. But I don't think that's anything that you need to just allow them to do either. We ought to be using the rights that we enjoy. There's many rights that American citizens are also supposed to be able to enjoy today. There's, I mean, this is, this is probably one of the freest countries that's ever existed. And uh, these rights were, are supposedly supposed to be protected by the Constitution that was created, you know, hundreds of years ago. But these rights are under attack. And these rights have been under attack for a long time. And when you don't use... The, the, the rights, if you're not exercising your freedoms and you're not exercising your liberties, you're not exercising your rights, they're going to be encroached upon because there's always going to be people opposing that. There's always going to be people that want to shut you down and shut you up. And when it comes to um, probably the most important right that we have is the, the freedom of speech and being able to speak our mind and preach the gospel and, and, and preach what we believe. Now, as I mentioned, there's always people that are going to fight against the things that you are for. There's always people like that. It's evident. And more importantly, there's always people that hate and fight against God. And the people in this room love God and, and believe this word and, and believe everything about this. And there's always going to be people that hate God and will have nothing to do with it and want to silence and censor and shut down the work that you're doing in any way possible. Whatever it is that you're doing that's for God, there's people that want to fight against you. And that's always going to be the way it is. Now, if you are just silent and you're not exercising the rights you have today to practice and to do what God has for you to do, the people that hate God, when they, as, soon as, you, as soon as you back off a little bit, they're going to keep moving forward. We need to be vigilant to make sure we're continuing to press forward, that we're continuing to push and to use the rights that we have. Because what, it's, it's a lot easier to take the rights away from a few than it is from many. I mean, that's just the way, it, I mean, that's the way things work in this world, whether it's right or wrong. You know, the, the, the government actually that was founded in this country was built upon the premise or the concept that everybody has rights regardless of how many people agree with it or whatever. You know, the, the, being able to protect the rights of a minority from a majority. That was the concept and, and part of the design of, of the legal structure of this country. And that, while that is important, and that's that the way things should be or things ought to be, 
over time, you know, what, <laughs> that's not always the way things work out. And you can see there's this, this minority of people, but they're, they're very vocal, of God-haters that are actually swaying and, and making changes and encroaching on our liberties to be able to, to, to work, to live, to do things, and um, are bringing persecution against Christians. And this is not the time to back down right. at all. This is actually the time to, to push forward and not just stand and withstand, but to be able to actually push forward and go on the offense. Men of God have faced persecutions all throughout history. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter. And it goes through this great list of, of great men of God who have done um, so many things, works for God based on their faith. It talks about Abraham. It talks about Moses. You know, when Abraham left his, his father's house and traveled into a country that he didn't know of. And, I mean, it took great faith to do that, to just rely on God and trust God in, in the uh, course of action that he was making him do or telling him to do. Same thing with Moses. When he uh, forsook being, being called a son of Pharaoh and gave up the pleasures of sin for a season. We're going to jump in down here in verse number 32. It's going to kind of summarize um, many other people that have, that have died for the cause of Christ. In verse 32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us, should not be made perfect. Now, well, pointing out here is all these great men of God and all these people that are getting these, um, this, great, this mention that of, of standing up for the faith, of going through the stonings, going through the temptations, being killed, being sawn asunder, being literally cut in half for their faith. These people that endured so much, wandering through the deserts and enduring all these persecutions and still not backing down and pushing forward. We live in a country today where we're not facing this type of persecution. Yet so many Christians are doing nothing. These people were standing in the face of all opposition, knowing that they could be put to death and still standing for their faith, still preaching the truth, still doing what they're supposed to be doing. We still have freedom in this country to preach the truth and not get arrested for it and not worry about getting beat up for it and not worry about being just thrown in prison and have them throw away the key or getting cut in half. I mean, can you imagine living in an era or a time or a place where they're going to actually saw your body in half because you believe on Jesus Christ? Because you're actually proclaiming the truth to people? Because you're using your voice to convey a message? I mean, that's what the Apostle Paul said when he was arrested. He's saying, you know what? I haven't done anything wrong to anybody except for this voice, except for the words that I'm teaching, except that I'm putting faith in Jesus Christ, he said, or except because I believe in the resurrection of the dead, the same which they also claim to believe, that there's a resurrection of the dead. I just claim that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Yet he was locked up. He was imprisoned. We are not facing that. Now, I believe the time is coming, and it's probably coming quicker rather than later in this country. In fact, I, I know that it's coming. The reason why I say it is because sin always brings bondage. 
without fail. And the amount of sin and serious sin that this country's in, we're, we're destined for God's judgment and for the bondage to come. And it's evident. I mean, you could just go through the go through history and you could see the you know even recent current times and current history with how the police state is forming, how much less freedoms you have. I mean, you can't even get on a plane these days and just travel across the country without getting practically strip searched or going through an, you know, a, a scanner that's going to give you cancer or whatever. You know, there's, there's all these different things that you just have to give up. All these freedoms now that, well, you, just, you have to give it up now. And we're losing them one by one. And now, and now we're to the point to where they have free speech zones. Oh, well, you know... I know that the, there's other documents that state that you have God-given rights, you know, to, to be able to just speak your mind and have a freedom to, to practice your religion and to believe what you want to believe. But now we're only going to allow you to do that in these, in these little sections over here. You could only practice that, you know, what's that saying is that they're saying, well, we have the authority and we have the power to dictate when and where you can speak your mind. Meaning that we are not recognizing that you actually have this right given to you by God. We're saying we're the ones giving you that right and you can only do it over here. And that is the attitude that this government is taking and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And you know what? When you say, oh, well, it's the government, we got to obey. That's false. You don't just have to obey everything. The Bible says, you know, we ought to obey God rather than men. And anything that comes in contradiction, you know, when the government tries to tell you, oh, you can't do this because, you know, you need to stay in the free city, whatever, you know, when they're going to encroach on your God-given rights and your God-given freedoms, if you don't stand up and if you don't resist and if you don't defy that, well, the bully's going to keep on taking and encroaching more and more and more. The more compliant you are to those types of, of um, abuses of power and encroachments of authority, then it's going to just get worse and worse and worse. And the reason why we're even where we're at today is because the good men, the men of God, are not standing up and filling the gap and, and stopping the aggression towards us. Now, if you can't stand up and preach the truth now, when it's easy, when we are still enjoying these freedoms, when are you ever going to do it? Because it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get harder from here on out. The times are coming when it's just going to be more and more persecution are going to rise. The Bible says in Jeremiah 12, 5, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Meaning that, you know, if you've just run with the footmen, you know, if you've just done this smaller amount, and that's already just worn on you and you can't handle that, what's going to happen when it gets even worse? What's going to happen when the horsemen come? You know, you can't even contend or fight with the footmen. You can't run with them. But what about when people, when it's, when it's kicked up a notch? If you can't even do the basics, the simple things, how are you ever going to do when the persecution rises? If you can't do right now the soul winning, if you can't go out and preach the gospel when we do not get harassed at all. There's many places around the world where you can't even do what we do on a regular basis because of fear of, of persecution and, and arrest and imprisonment and everything else. What are you going to do? You know, you, you, are you going to say, oh yeah, well when, when the tribulation comes, then I'm going to be this great on fire soul winner for God. No, you won't. If you're not doing it now, you're never going to do it. We need, you need to get started today. You need to make today the day that you decide to do even more and to utilize and to make use of the freedoms that you have. The title of my message this morning is Don't Waste Your Freedom. Don't waste it. Value the freedom that you have today. And especially when you read the Bible and you see what everyone else has faced. You know, it's easy to just be complacent and to just assume you have all these freedoms because that's just the way you've always known it to be and you can't imagine it some other way. And then just take it for granted as if, oh, it's always going to be there. And then never go through and, um, and actually use the freedoms that you have. When you, when you get complacent and, and you think it's always going to be there, you're going to lose it. 
Make today the day you decide to do more, to say, you know what, I'm not going to waste my freedom. I'm going to go out. I am going to preach the gospel. I know that it's something that God's commanded me to do. And before the persecution gets too tough, before they start passing all these laws saying, well, you can't preach it. You know, and, and it's, if you look at the media at all, Christians are continually being barraged with, with these attacks that... Um, you know, it's 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 a wicked, it's a hateful religion, and all this other stuff. It used to be the you know the the Muslims or other religions were being touted as being um, evil or corrupt, and now it's just it's kind of turning even within its own country to the attack is just going being focused on the Christians, and um, you think oh that you know nothing will ever happen here in this in this country. It's the it's already been happening. All the references to God and the Bible have been slowly removed from all public areas, from the school systems, from the courthouses, from any, any of these buildings. You know, there's the, the enemy has been slowly attacking and attacking and attacking and willing away and trying to get rid of this stuff. And the haters of God that don't want to see it and can't stand seeing the word of God anywhere have been battling and succeeding in removing that from our culture. We need to make sure that we can fight the opposition and fight for the truth and not allow ourselves to be silenced. Never fear to proclaim the truth boldly. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 11. I've got two examples here from Jesus Christ. Specific situations where people have gotten upset and offended by what he was preaching and what he was saying. Yes, Jesus Christ did offend people. And I think what's really important to notice as we look at these scriptures, these examples, is the attitude that he had about it. People today, the world today is going to tell you that you can't, you know, you shouldn't be offending anybody as a Christian. You need to be welcoming everybody in and make sure that you're not offending everyone because you know, you need to bring as many people to Christ as possible. And if that means you, you, you don't offend them, then you just watch what you say. And that is not what Jesus did. Now, did Jesus want everyone to be saved? Of course he did. You know, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he wasn't willing to compromise on the truth. He wasn't willing to withhold the message of the truth and what people need to hear. He said it, and he said it boldly, and he didn't care what anybody said ultimately. I mean, he cared in his heart if people receive it or not, but he's not going to change. He's not going to back down on what he's saying. You don't fear about people being turned off. That is not your job. Your job is to preach the truth, to preach God's word. If someone gets offended because of God's word, it's not your fault. But you, you're, you need to make sure that you are preaching all of God's word and that you're not withholding from him. Don't feel like you have to censor the message to just try to keep people around, to try to keep people coming back. And I'll read this for you in John chapter 6 and verse 66. The Bible reads, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And that was when Jesus gave his, you know, saying that I am the bread of life. And, and, and he went on that whole... Um, sermon about that and at that point many of his disciples people that were following him his disciples they stopped following him they're just like i don't know what this guy's saying or they didn't like what he was saying they got offended and in the light of this huge group of people leaving him and leaving his ministry and not having anything to do with them did he say whoa no wait you just misunderstood me come back come back that's not what he did you know what he did he turned to the twelve that were with him, he says, will you also go away? These guys are all leaving. You want to go too? Go ahead. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. See, the twelve knew. They were there with Jesus Christ. They, were, they, they, they didn't want to go anywhere. They, they wanted to hear it. Now, you may lose, when you speak the truth, you may lose people that don't want to hear, you know, you may, you may lose Facebook friends. You may, you may lose people from, from wanting to hear the things that you're saying. But the people who really love God, they're going to stick around and they're going to actually love to hear those things. And that's the, that is the philosophy that I take with this church and, and the messages and the, and the things that I decide to preach from this Bible, it, it, because I'm going to preach it all. 
And if something's going to turn people away, then so be it. I mean, Jesus wasn't afraid of his disciples, his own disciples leaving him. Because he was preaching the truth and everything that Christ taught was true. I'm also not going to be afraid of people leaving this church or leaving, you know, whatever. Go ahead. Go away. If you don't like God's word, if you don't like what's being preached here, then leave. I'm not going to run and chase after you and try to plead with you if, if what I'm preaching is right now, if you disagree with something I'm saying and you have scriptural evidence for it and you want to you know, approach me and, and talk to me about the subject, I'll talk to you about it. And, and we should be able to agree on, on this being the truth and God's word being the truth. That's not what I'm talking about. But people here, I mean, they got offended at what Jesus was saying. They, didn't, they left. They heard what he said and they, and they didn't like it for whatever reason and they, they decided to leave. And I'm going to take that same stance. Now, if you're speaking the truth, you also ought to be confident in what you're preaching and what you're saying. The, the words that come out of your mouth, you ought, to, you ought to carefully consider the things that you say. And if you know you're speaking the truth, you ought to be ready to double down on the words that you say. To just, just stand firm on the statements that you make. If you're preaching the truth. But you should know that you're preaching the truth um, beforehand. You shouldn't be, because what's going to happen is that you'll get challenged. You, when you say things that could be hard hitting, when you say things that, that might sound extreme or that might offend a lot of people, you're going to get the backlash real quick and people are going to try to make you doubt the things that you even said. But you, that's why you need to be confident in what you're saying and what you're preaching to be true. Because then you don't have to worry about getting offended or, you know, or backpedaling or having to apologize for what you say. You need to be able to double down like Jesus Christ did in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, Jesus is going off on the Pharisees. I mean, he's laying into them. And look at verse number 45. This is where we're going to jump in. Verse 45, the Bible reads, Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, Thou reproachest us also. So now you know, a lawyer interjects, you know, Christ is railing on the Pharisees. He's, he, well, he's not railing on them, but he's, he's, he's rebuking them and he's reproaching them and he's get, you know, laying out their sins abroad and, and, and letting people know that, you know, what they're, what they're doing is false and just, just exposing their sins. And the lawyers hear this and they say, well, wait a minute. Whoa, hold, hold on a second there, Jesus. Now, because what you're saying now, then you're reproaching us also. Are you going to reproach the lawyers too, Jesus? Well, look at his response, verse 46. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers! For ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers! For ye have taken away the key of knowledge, ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Jesus Christ doubled down on what he was saying. He was rebuking the Pharisees. He was calling them out for their hypocrisy, calling them out for their errors. And then when one of the lawyers said, oh, oh, hold on a second there, buddy, because now you're, now you're reproaching us. And Jesus said, yes, I am reproaching you. And he went further to lay out the reasons why. And he's basically calling them murderers. He said, you're the children of your fathers, the fathers that killed the prophets. You're just as wicked as your fathers are. He was calling them out in strong terms. And they didn't like it. And, and you see their method of attack then is that they're laying wait for him in, the, in verse 54, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Which is why you always ought to be careful with the things that you say. When you know the truth and you know it, not just you've heard it and you're repeating it. When you know it, you could stand firm and stand strong. You get yourself in trouble when you just repeat things that you've heard. Even things that... 
you agree with, and maybe maybe you've heard a sermon and um, you know it, it made sense to you, and you received it. But if you're going to be doing the preaching and, 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 and being willing to stand up, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying not to necessarily stand up for it, but be prepared and careful with the things that come out of your mouth and um, be able to defend the things that you say based on Scripture and know them for yourself so that you don't get caught on your heels and have to, to back up or backpedal. And when you start making these types of statements and, and you know, Jesus was rebuking these people and calling out the sin and calling out the wickedness and the hypocrisy, they were just waiting to catch him at something that he said where he might misspeak. So we got to be careful too to make sure that we're not misspeaking and misrepresenting what we're saying, but that everything you say is true. And the way that you're going to do that is by knowing the truth, by knowing God's word, by knowing the topics that you're talking about. And finally, this is a shorter sermon today, we're going we're to look at a few verses. You'll turn a few over to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> we enjoy a lot of freedom in this country. The freedom to congregate this morning and, and be able to hold sermons like this. The freedom even to be able to publish what we're preaching on the internet and be able to publish it to the whole world. That's good freedom. We have freedom. We have, we have free access to, to the Bible. We, have, we, have lot, we enjoy many, many freedoms. We don't want to waste our freedoms, but to use them to, 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 to keep pushing harder and, and, and to use it to its utmost. I mean, you have the freedom to go out and knock on doors and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's use that. Before the persecution comes, get, get founded and grounded and in the habit of doing that thing so that when the persecution starts, you're not going to back off and say, oh, well, I'm not going to do it. I mean, someone who, who's never gone out soul winning, who's never opened up their mouth to preach the gospel, if they're not doing it when it's easy, there's no way they're going to do it when it's difficult. It's just going to be that many more reasons not to open up your mouth, not to preach out of that fear, the fear of the government. But if you've been doing it, It'll be a lot easier to say, oh, I've done this before. I'm going to keep on doing this. And no, you can't stop the, the word of God from being preached. That, so that's one way we don't want to waste our freedom. But there's another way that we could waste our freedom that we have. And that's the freedom that we have in Christ. Because we know that Christ came and paid for all of our sins. And he has made us free from those sins and free from the bondage of that sin. Sin brings you into bondage. It's going to bring you into captivity. When you get involved in a sin, you become a slave or a servant to that sin and to that bondage. And we need to make sure that we don't waste the freedom that Christ provides for us, the freedom in Christ from the law, by entangling ourselves again in sin and becoming servants to that sin. Galatians 5.1 reads, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We need to stand firm, stand fast in that liberty, that glorious liberty that Christ has freed us from our sins. You're in Romans 6. Look at verse number 14. Romans 6.14 reads, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And this is explaining that very point that, look, Christ has made us free from the law, from, that, from the bondage of sin. But whoever you decide to serve, you said who, whoever, whoever servants um, you yield yourselves to is who you're going to obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And jump up, if you would, to, to verse number 1 of Romans 6. Because this is what the easy believism crowd, which is what we believe, that it's easy to be saved, that all you got to do is put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the problems that people have with, with this truth of, the, of, of free salvation is that they think then, oh, well, you could just go out and sin then. You, you'll, 
Yeah, it's not going to affect my salvation. But that's not what we teach is that just go off and get into sin. Look at verse number 1 of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Meaning that if you continue in sin, as a born-again believer in Christ, if you go out and you continue in sin, after you've received Christ as your Savior, after your faith has been put in Him, grace abounds. Because God's grace, the, the payment that Jesus Christ made, covers all of that sin. So the more that you sin, the more that that grace will abound to cover that sin. But is that something that we should be doing? God forbid. In verse number, God forbid that you should do that. Of course not. The implication is that, yes, that does happen, but just because the grace covers your sin doesn't mean that you should do that. Verse number two, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Girls, pay attention and look forward. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Just as Christ was crucified and nailed to that cross and he took our sins, we need to, to approach our life, our daily walk, as our old man, our flesh, has been nailed to that cross with Christ. It's been nailed and it was buried. And the salvation that we receive in that new man, that new creature that's born again, that's the newness of life that we need to be walking in. Don't allow yourself to become, to go back into bondage. Don't waste your freedom. Christ has made you free from the law by saving your soul, by giving you a pardon over your sins. Don't waste that freedom by just going right back into sin and just becoming a bondage that because you're not going to do anything for God that way. You're not going to earn any rewards that way. You're not going to lead a joyful life that way. You're not going to have any of the goodness that you are now capable of receiving as becoming a citizen of the commonwealth of Israel right from above the new Jerusalem. You are a citizen of that new Jerusalem, that heavenly city that's going to come from above. By virtue of being born again, you have an inheritance don't waste it. Don't waste it. Use it rather and, and make sure that you are building up in this lifetime, you know, treasures in heaven. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All things are lawful if you're saved, but it's not expedient. It's not good for you just to, to do all things. He said, all things are lawful for me, but I will not, I will not be brought under the power of any. Decide for yourself who you're going to serve. Are you going to waste the freedom that Christ has given you and go back and be a servant of sin and just get into some bondage, get into whatever sin it is, smoking, drinking, fornication, you know, whatever, any, any sin, you name it, and it'll bring you into bondage. Use the freedom they have. Use the freedom that we have in this country Use it to preach the gospel. Use it to, to, to preach the truth. Not even just preaching the gospel, preaching the truth. Use it to speak your mind. Use it to, to, to preach what God has for you and, and to not be silenced. And use, and use the right that you have. Use the freedom that Christ has given you wisely and not being brought under the, po uh, the bondage of sin. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the freedom that you, you provide for us through Jesus Christ. And um, we thank you that we, just, we, we happen to be lucky enough to have been born into a, a place and a, a country here where we are enjoying freedoms here. Lord, help us not to take these freedoms for granted. Help us to be able to do the work that you've laid out for us to do and do that boldly, dear Lord. Not to waste what we have. Not to just... Um, waste our life away by, by enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season like Moses could have done 
And it may not be the easiest thing to do, but right now, dear Lord, it, it's easier than it probably ever has been to go out and preach your word. Help us to, to be strengthened. Help us to, to do the work while it's easy on us and uh, that we might be able to endure in times of trouble and persecution, dear Lord. We love you and we thank you for all the freedom that you've given unto us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.